we're on to the last, or nearly the last leg, but certainly the last panel. Um, I'm Kim Boyer. I'm chair of the Tasmanian branch of the AIIA, and I'm really excited about uh, chairing this panel, The Health of the Planet, where we go beyond the nation state and look at the environment and issues of international relations in the environment that impact on the planet as a whole. We've got a great um, panel of speakers um, from my immediate left is Dr Tony Press, another fellow Tasmanian, although he claims he's only been there for 20 years and so he can't count as a Tasmanian yet. That's not true. Um, Tony's been one of the key architects of the um, wondrous Antarctic Treaty, which celebrates its 60th year this year and which has been a focus for the Tasmanian branch, the Tasmanian AIIA, and will continue to be so. Then we've got the Honourable Penny Wensley, who's well known to all of the masterclass attendees and well known to everyone in this audience as one of our um, most leading diplomats. But today, Penny is going to be talking in her role as Chair of the Council of the Australian Institute of Marine Science, and she's going to be talking about oceans, ocean conservation and biodiversity. Um, then we've got Nigel Warren from the CSIRO, um, who's going to be talking about adaptive technology in science. He says this is not his area of expertise, but I bet it is. Um, and then Sarah Davies, who's got a great um, CV in um, Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And Sarah's going to be talking today about Australia's role in regional health security, um, with probably a bit about women thrown in there too, which is great. Um, I'm not going to do the same as the um, other panel chairs and ask a question of each of the panel members when they finish speaking. Instead, we've negotiated that they can maybe take eight to 10 minutes, like a bit over eight minutes to talk. And then if they want to ask questions of each other, that's great. If not, over to you, or they'll just consider themselves as part of the audience in the question asking thing. So um, please, first of all, make welcome Tony Press. Thank you. For those um, who don't know me, I, I'm neither a diplomat nor an international lawyer, so I, I won't be going into the, into the legal in intricacies of the things that I'm talking about, but I'm, I want to just give you an overview of the kinds of international instruments that I've dealt with in my career uh, in the environment. I'd rather talk about the ones that I know a little bit about than the ones that I don't know much about. And I'll try not to um, walk into Penny's um, space. I want to start off by saying <clears throat> that it's fair to say that our planet is facing a serious and fundamental threat to its health and its resilience. And that threat is climate change. And you can't dress it up any more subtly than that it is a threat. There might be some opportunities there, but at the moment, in the way the world comprehensively is responding to climate change, uh, it remains a threat. It's manifesting itself in our own domestic environment and onto our economy. When I was born, three hours up the road, a little town called Karkor, there was about 280 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There are now 408 parts per million concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the trajectory is business as usual. So on a global scale, nothing that we've done uh, in the last decade or two, the lost decades, has 
bent the curve of the carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gas um, concentrations. Like climate change, many other environmental issues ignore international boundaries. Air pollution, ocean environmental issues, persistent organic pollutants, and some of the other manifestations uh, of, of environmental damage don't stop at the borders of the countries that are receiving the pollution or are producing the pollution. So it's obvious that significant environmental issues need to be dealt with globally through multilateral engagement and through inclusion. I've got a list of agreements that have been negotiated over the years. I'll just read them out. But we go back to 1946, the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling, the 1971 Convention on Wetlands of International Importance, 1972, the Convention on Prevention of Marine Pollution, 1973, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, the International Convention for, the, <coughs> for Prevention of Pollution from Ships, Convention on the Long Range Tran Transboundary Air Pollution, 1979, Convention on Migratory Species of Wild Animals, United, <coughs> United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which we in Australia call UNCLOS, and many others called the Loss Convention, the Vieta Convention on the Protection of the Ozone Layer, and the subsequently the Protocol on sub Substance Depletion in the Ozone Layer, one of the brilliantly successful envir international environmental treaties. The Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, and the three um, conventions or international agreements that I personally have had deep involvement with. And I'll call the first one an environmental um, treaty. It wasn't really, it was a peace treaty and a, a nuclear disarmament treaty, but it rapidly evolved to have a conservation and environmental protection component, and that was the Antarctic Treaty. Um, negotiated in 1959, followed by its Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, and then uh, in 1990, the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty, the Madrid Protocol, and there's also a further outside of that sphere, uh, but, but related, was the Agreement on the Conservation of albatrosses and petrels. The important thing to know about the successful treaties, the ones that actually kick goals, uh, is that they are successful because they have active adherence, they have very good internal governance, mechanisms and they engage constructively with states that have different capabilities. Australia has played a significant role in the negotiation of many international environmental agreements and in their governance and lawmaking and Penny will probably talk a lot more about that in a moment. Protecting the environment and aggressively tackling critical issues like climate change is in the national interest and it's in Australia's national interest. The Prime Minister 
um, said recently at the Lowy Institute, our environment, our oceans, our coasts, our grazing and pasture lands, our water resources, our soil depend upon our practical conservation. Indeed they do, but they are also influenced by things that happen outside of our control, so beyond our practical conservation. But he did go on to say, I'm determined Australia will play a more active role in standard setting. I have tasked the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to come back to me with a comprehensive audit of global institutions and rulemaking processes where we have the greatest stake. Now, I think that's a very good idea. Some people might have read some dark intent in that. But it is true that Australia has played a significant role in very important international treaties and negotiations that ultimately will protect Australia from global environmental damage. And I think, uh, if there's anyone from DFAT in the room, when you're drawing up that list, you should look at some of the gold standards. I think the Antarctic Treaty system, the, the, the whole of the system, its individual treaties and agreements, but collectively all of those together are a gold standard in international transboundary environmental management and there are and there are others so i'll finish up by saying we do have an opportunity to act in our national interest by engaging multilaterally by empowering countries that have less capacity than us or fewer resources, by capacity building, but also by civil and active engagement. And when we do that, we can achieve great things. Thank you. Penny, over to you. Are oh, you going to have straight then questions? Yes. Yep. yes. Okay. Well, thanks, Kim, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to the Australian Institute of International Affairs for the opportunity to contribute to this panel on the health of the planet. As a former Australian ambassador to the UN for seven years, uh, and also ambassador for the environment, I'm very pleased to see the Institute paying greater attention to the subject of environmental challenges, their impact on international affairs and their implications for Australia and Australian foreign policy. Although some, at least, of the subjects that uh, we four have been asked to address on this panel will inevitably, inexorably, lead us or begin us uh, with the subject of climate change and global warming, I do think it's good to broaden the discussion and raise awareness of what is happening in some other areas, including on the very big subject that I was given, oceans, conservation and biodiversity. Uh, the time available is uh, challengingly short uh, for such a vast topic, uh, but I thought I, it was very important to use this as an awareness-raising opportunity and to put things in context. So I want to talk, firstly, about the importance of oceans, secondly, their declining state, uh, then move on to recent important 
international developments on ocean action, and then uh, offer some remarks about Australia's situation. First of all, covering 72% of the Earth's surface, oceans, or what some are now calling the global ocean, are simply critical to health, wealth, and human survival. Oceans support the greatest biodiversity on the planet. They're home to millions of plants and animals, and a very significant part of our oceans are not yet explored so, uh, or mapped, so the potential for discovery of further organisms is actually very high. More than three billion people depend, depend on the ocean for their primary source of protein. Over three billion people depend on marine and coastal biodiversity for their livelihoods. According to the World Resources Institute, the value of goods and services from the ocean amounts to more than US $3 trillion annually, 5% of global GDP. And that figure is expected to double by 2030. The global ocean accounts for 140 million jobs in fishing and aquaculture, and many more millions in indirect employment in what I'd call sea-related activities. Shipping accounts for the transport of more than 90% of the world's traded goods, which we've discussed in earlier panels. And the ocean, obviously, has fundamental political and military strategic importance. It holds substantial precious mineral and energy sources. And here's that climate link. The oceans regulate the Earth's systems. They absorb heat and redistribute around the world by way of currents and interactions with the atmosphere. They drive climate and weather systems. They play a key role in the carbon cycle, absorbing gases and a great amount of carbon dioxide about, at the moment, about 30% of the carbon dioxide produced by humans, they buffer the impacts of global warming. Now for the threats. Ocean health is under severe and growing pressure in the context of that growing pressure that you talked about more broadly with environmental pressures. David Attenborough said at the end of his well-known Blue Planet TV series, oceans are under threat now as never before in human history. Humanity is losing the foods, the jobs, and the environmental services that a healthy ocean generates. The threats are from overfishing, including illegal and unregulated fishing, plastic and other pollution, coastal development, and here it is again, the impacts of climate change. Those impacts include warming of the oceans, acidification, and sea level rise. There's been a 26% rise in acidification measured since the Industrial Revolution. Marine pollution, overwhelmingly from land-based sources, is reaching catastrophic, alarming levels, with an average of 13,000 pieces of plastic litter to be found on every square kilometre of the global ocean. The threats are so extensive, 40% of the world's oceans are now classified as seriously affected, and virtually no area, no area remains untouched. Thirdly, this serious decline has led to a really sharp acceleration in international attention being paid to oceans in the last four or five years. You mentioned UNCLOS. That goes back to the early 70s uh, when I was ambassador for the environment working on the Biodiversity Convention, Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Basel Convention and so on. Um, all of these issues were being talked about, but uh, I sometimes have a feeling that this is Groundhog Day. Uh, I'm back in that terrible, terrible movie, and we're just going over these things again and again. But the fact is, the situation has deteriorated very dramatically, and so there has been this quite steep 
acceleration in international attention now being paid to oceans. In, just let me run through the last four years. In 2015, the UN Sustainable Development Summit, and many of you here know all about the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, set one of the 17 goals, number 14, as the goal to conserve and sustain, sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. In 2017, we saw the first UN Ocean Conference, which issued a call for action, our ocean, our future, our call to action. Last year, in 2018, responding to that call, a small group of world leaders, then Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull among them, established a high-level panel for sustainable ocean economy, aimed at catalyzing bold action for ocean protection and production. This year, in 2019, in March, the World Meteorological Organization produced a statement on the state of the global climate in 2018. That produced striking evidence of record warming, uh, increasing uh, sea level rise, loss of sea ice, extreme weather events. And here in Australia, we can appreciate that quite clearly. In June this year, at the G20 summit, so this is moving on to other agendas, not just people working on negotiation of environmental agreements. The G20 summit, Japan's Prime Minister Abe launched a marine initiative, initiative and the Osaka Blue Ocean Vision to advance effective actions to combat marine plastic litter on a global scale. Last month, the IPCC issued a special report on the ocean and cryosphere, I asked you to help me with that word, uh, in, a, in a changing climate. Again, bringing forward uh, these messages that these things are happening faster than we can address them. And that high-level panel that I mentioned a moment ago met again just a few weeks ago and issued an urgent call for ocean-based climate action. So the subjects are coming all together. But this time with a new twist, saying that uh, they want to look at the ocean as a solution, not a victim, and looking at ways in which required reductions in greenhouse gas emissions could come from the ocean sector. They are going to bring their recommendations to the World Ocean Conference to be held in June next year in Lisbon, aimed at scaling up ocean action based on science and innovation. Which brings me, fourthly and finally, to Australia, which has both major reason and major capacity to contribute to these international efforts. We're a marine nation with a huge ocean estate. We claim the world's third largest marine jurisdiction, more than double our land mass. We have so sovereign rights over most of this estate. Our marine estate is a vital national asset. Our marine industries are one of the fastest growing parts of our economy. The value has more than doubled in the past 10 years. It has overtaken agriculture in importance. Now worth $70 billion a year, supporting more than 390,000 jobs and projected to grow three times faster than our GDP over the next decade. Overall, it contributes close to a billion a year to our economy. We will see it reach 100 billion by 2025. 99% not the 90 for the rest of the world, 99% of our trade by volume is carried by sea. 85% of Australians live within 50 kilometres of the coast. So, and that compares with 50% of the world population that live on the coast, although that is going to increase to 72% over the next five, seven years. Given those statistics, it's not at the least bit surprising that we should be a world leader 
for the protection and sustainable use of the ocean. And to my direct knowledge, as chairman of the Australian Institute of Marine Science for the past five years and chairman of the Great Barrier Reef Advisory Committee since mid-2015, we are actually at the forefront of many, many areas relevant for protecting ocean health and biodiversity. We are incontestably a global leader in marine science and in marine conservation. We have a world-class fisheries management system. We are a world leader in biodiversity conservation. We have internationally renowned marine protected areas. We have the largest representative network of marine reserves in the world covering one third of our waters. We are leading global efforts to protect and restore mangroves, tidal marshes and seagrasses. We're at the forefront of efforts to protect and build the resilience of coral reefs and we are the world leader on reef adaptation to climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, clearly there's a great urgency to act to address the threats to ocean health. Australia, I suggest, I believe is exceptionally well positioned to play a very substantial role in answering the global call to ocean action. We have agency, we have heft, we can exert influence in many key areas and to do so will serve our national and regional interests and advance our international standing. Thank you. Thanks, Penny. Thank you. Always a privilege to follow Penny. Thanks, Penny. Um, look, I wanted to sort of contain my remarks today around adaptive technologies and resilient and, val and val invaluable environments. My name's Nigel Warren. I'm the Executive Director of Growth at CSIRO. Um, what I will start off on, though, and I think it's an important point and something that I've seen change uh, over the last four years that I've been in the organisation, is science and technology, particularly in this area, particularly in the environment, as a really uh, increasingly interesting uh, set of tools and platform when it comes to Australia's foreign policy um, objectives and priorities in certain parts of the world. And I wanted to kind of give you some perspective on what I've seen change inside, not just the organisation being CSIRO, but also partners, and the sort of global um, change and integration of the organisation, particularly in the area of the environment, but I'll break down some specific areas throughout our region where we've seen a lot of change as well. Um, if you look back just four years ago, uh, the organisation um, collaborated uh, internationally 47% of the time. This year it's 63%. So you're seeing this huge change of our scientists uh, globally collaborating on issues. Why is that? Um, countries in our own neighbourhood, countries around the world have got common challenges common issues of concern, and they're looking for each other to solve those large problems. Um, we've got some specific areas that we focus on when it comes to international um, partnerships. Uh, a great many of them are focused on the environment. It probably wouldn't be a surprise to the audience here today, but a common uh, driver when you look at relationships that we've got with peer organisations is the environment. Um, We've got a very globally driven workforce. 35% of the staff at CSIRO are born outside of Australia. Um, we co-publicate with 130 countries. So you've got this sort of globally active workforce uh, inside the organisation, and that's not different to university partners as well. But I really think that global engagement, and you would have seen that in a part of our 2015 strategy, Global Engagement National Benefit, is something that you're going to see even uh, more vibrant and ever-changing and growing when it comes to foreign policy priorities in certain parts of the world. Um, I'm going to focus most of my remarks on resilient and valuable environments and really sort of see where that um, is relevant in terms of the context of the health of the planet, but mainly focus on some of the research areas that we're working on uh, and some of the trends that we're seeing and give you some examples of some of the work that's going on already. It's only going to be uh, the tip of the iceberg and uh, really gives you just a snapshot of what's happening, but sort of will give you flavour of sort of some of the opportunities that we're seeing. Um, when it comes to trends, when it comes to sustainability, 
globally, rising populations are depleting resources at such a rate. Each year, 90 billion tonnes of primary materials are extracted and used globally. Only 9% are recycled. It's a staggering amount. Mm. Today, our industries, our agriculture industry, have and continue to adapt to the environmental factors they encounter, but it's increasingly difficult. Climate change is really only going to increase the stress on our ecosystems, which are already threatened. Australia is really considered to be one of the world's mega diverse countries. However, over the past 200 years, Australia has lost more species than any other continent and continues to have the highest rate of species decline amongst OECD countries. It sort of really gives you pause for thought. We are not alone in this regard. The loss of biodiversity is drawing increased focus around the globe. Whenever I talk to any of the partner countries that we're represented in now, which is seven, whether it's Chile or it's Vietnam or it's Indonesia, these are very common issues that come to the front and the fore of conversation at the very start of any sort of uh, science agreement or joint project that we're working on. And I can really only see that increase. Um, I also really wanted to mention the change in societal awareness um, and the driving pressure to see economic growth um, while trying to focus on sustainability. How do the two really exist and survive together? Specifically, I really would like to focus attention on energy, water and food management, as well as a major transition to a more effective circular economy. Um, within that context, uh, we've got some specific areas that we focus on. I won't go through all of them, but the core areas of research and development, the core areas of investment that we make, uh, the spin-out companies that we're supporting, the universities that we're partnering with, the countries throughout the region uh, that we're building agreements with are focused in some key areas. Atmosphere and climate, uh, biodiversity, extreme events, uh, the prediction of extreme events, land management and sustainable development, oceans, coasts and water, and the circular economy and waste management. Um, I'll only focus on circular economy and waste management, respectful of the eight minutes. I could talk about all the areas for probably a couple of hours, but I'll just focus just focus on circular economy. Um, it's a really a natural area for us to work, on other, to work with other countries and global partners on. If we just look at the one area of research and the research into the recovery of metals and minerals and the development of new battery materials, there's a range of growing global opportunities that we're seeing. Only 2 to 3% of lithium batteries are currently recycled. The rest is sent to landfill, which is staggering. Used batteries can be used for components. They can be given a second life in a different application, whether that be for an electric vehicle battery or to power a home. We really believe that low battery recycling rates can be overcome through a much better understanding of the importance of recycling, an improved collection process, and by implementing different ways to recycle these materials. Um, we've just entered into a partnership with a Japanese company to look at this, and this is something that's um, very natural and that we'll find that global partner that will want to accelerate that commercialization. What we really need to do is to bring that learning back to uh, our domestic environment here in Australia. The other example I wanted to just touch on was uh, power generation and energy generation. Um, another green technology collaboration that we really feel has got significant uh, opportunity to make a change for the health of the planet is really the development of clean hydrogen technologies. Uh, in May this year, we signed a new agreement between Australia and Canada, enabling, enabling greater collaboration in this area. And we're working with the University of British Columbia uh, to look at some joint clean energy research and demonstration projects, including hydrogen refueling infrastructure. I think hydrogen, if I look at out 10 years for the future of Australia, really has the potential not just to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions and enhance the resilience of the global energy system, but it really can become a, a global clean energy commodity for Australia, both domestically but also on the export front. Uh, we released a national uh, energy, hydrogen energy roadmap, which outlines where we believe there's an opportunity for hydrogen 
to compete favourably on a cost basis in local applications such as transport and remote area power systems. Nigel? Yes. Perfect. I'm just concluding, actually. <laughs> so that is one example where we're seeing a real change when it comes to the domestic market, but also opening up export opportunities that are directly re relevant for our neighbourhood. So in conclusion, a couple of examples for you. Broad portfolio of engagement right across this area in terms of environment. But one thing I'll leave you with is that most of the countries we're dealing with, this is a common challenge. It's the first thing that comes up uh, when we're looking to negotiate projects, programs, or science agreements. And I'll pass on for questions. Thanks. Thanks. Over to Sarah, last but not least. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be speaking at today's event. It's, there's been, it's been a really impressive day of speakers and it's a bit daunting to be amongst the last uh, on this panel, on this very distinguished panel. And I sincerely appreciate the organisers for the invitation to speak today and I would like to pay my personal respects to the owners of the traditional land on which we gather today and acknowledge their traditional owners past, present and future. Um, I think I was asked today because I was very fortunate in being able to launch a book that I wrote earlier this year called Containing Contagion, which was looking at the politics of disease outbreak, surveillance and response in Southeast Asia during some crucial, a crucial decade, the outbreak of the severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2003, up to the outbreak of the West Africa Ebola outbreak in 2014, which thankfully didn't make its way across to this region. But what I looked at over that roughly decade was the extreme effort to try and organise regional cooperation, in particular amongst the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, who had membership across the World Health Organisation, the regional offices, and two different regional offices, and the role that the Australian government had played in being one of a number of international conduits and supporters of that type of health diplomacy that was, that was really focused, a key focus during that decade. In a region where there has been sometimes resistance or different interpretations of the importance of international regulations around areas such as promptly reporting disease outbreaks, transparently reporting where they're occurring, communicating across with neighbours about suspected outbreaks and if they're unable to detect or, or, or verify what that outbreak is, seeking assistance to try and do so. And what I argue in that book is that that was not by accident, that was by a very deliberate design, a very deliberate dip diplomatic design to try and foster cooperation, to try and foster a, you know, a sense of collective interest. And I think given the conversation today has been around where is their agency, what issues are we facing in the future in terms of trust and how do we think about those future challenges and what works in response to what's ahead. I'd like to focus a little bit on those in light of the conversation that we've had today and in particular where I think there's future room for thinking, in particular in the area of health diplomacy. So I'm going to put my cards on the table straight away and say that I, I come at this as, as a functionalist knowing that there is a certain amount of problems with the way that 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 theory has developed over time. But what does that mean? I think it points to what Nigel's been talking about, which is the importance of thinking about cooperation in non-political contexts. And in particular, thinking about the importance of cooperation across countries in moments when there is, where there is contention, where there is a sense of heightened risk, where there is perhaps distrust in what we would see as our traditional institutions, our traditional rules actually looking across and thinking where is there opportunities for collective governance in perhaps sometimes what is seen as limited functional, technical and economic areas is actually really vital because what it often can do is capture those everyday human needs. Think about what is causing everyday insecurity and that can be a really important entry point into building future diplomatic trust and cooperation. I think health diplomacy captures this approach. It's not done with a sense of blind optimism. There is much knowledge, and as I document in that decade of looking at cooperation in this region, there's an acknowledgement that sometimes things still don't get reported. Sometimes people don't want to acknowledge what's happening. But there's also really important moments 
where through that constant effort to ensure that there is face-to-face -face meetings, that there is this elevation of health diplomacy to the highest levels in government meetings and regional meetings, there is a person to speak to on the other end of the line when you're facing a situation and you don't quite know how to negotiate your way next and forward. I think it's really important that we think about the deliberate agency that is invested into trying to think about how to use knowledge, expertise to improve the human conditions. As we've heard from this panel already, there are a number of really significant challenges that we all face. And dedicating political effort and diplomatic time and money, which we've heard from Melissa Connolly today, Tyler today in her report, DFAT, you know, is facing quite a significant struggle, but I think it's really important to think and acknowledge about where we diplomatically can have real power and agency. And I think in these sorts of functional areas, we have a really important role to play at the moment. The first area where I think it's really important to think about success or the potential for success where we could be doing more is the Indo-Pacific Centre for Health Security. I think the announcement of this centre was a really significant move, not because it actually delivered more money, it didn't, it was a shift of money, but what it was was an ambitious political statement about in the environment where the aid budget is shrinking, there was diplomatic ambition to try and think about where there's opportunity for greater politics and diplomacy in the region around an area that is of significant importance to this region. As Penny was saying, we are seeing rapid urbanisation occurring in our region. With rapid urbanisation comes the risk of more poverty traps, with, ra with rapid urbanisation in an environment where our climate is significantly changing. We are seeing health outbreaks and disease outbreaks, particularly mosquito borne diseases, really are going to have a massive impact on the way in which populations organise, the way in which they access water, sanitation, and there is real opportunities here amongst all this real risk to think about how we can diplomatically cooperate. That's why I think that in the area of multilateral exchanges, it was disappointing to me this morning to hear not more discussion about our key partners in the area of health diplomacy. We have long advocates such as Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, and even China in these areas, where there has been over a decade of hard work done to try and think with South Korea and the United States, as well as Canada and Norway, how we can collectively think about improving our regional and global health security. And I would like to see more discussion about how this can be done through areas such as exchanges in the areas of universal healthcare coverage, which we know some last month has been identified as a key platform moving forward. Our region has a lot of work to be doing in terms of influenza vaccine production, which is an, an exchange, which is an important area to focus on if we're thinking in peacetime, where is an area where we can think about vaccination production, distribution, distribution risk communication with public-private partnerships, in an environment where we're not yet under the type of threat that we would be during a disease outbreak. I also think we could be much more ambitious in the way we're thinking about our fellowships and our, and our, trend, and our partnerships in an education level. It's wonderful to see the ASEAN Australia Health Security Fellowships, the Health Silk Road by comparison, and the ASEAN uh, China 100 program is outranking us by about 10 times that amount at the moment. So I think we could be doing a lot more in that space as well. The second reason why I think this is really important is because while I've been talking optimistically about what we can do, I think we also need to be really cognizant of the fact that politically and operationally in our region, trust and communication is something that shouldn't be taken for granted. Pitchman was really interesting this morning when she was talking about civil societies and the pushback they're sometimes experiencing in the region and these, the, this delicate balance at the moment in the way some of those countries are going through their political transition. I think what we have to be aware of, and that's something that I think is quite different to what I was seeing when I wrote the book, is the way in which trust and communication in the last decade has radically changed in ways that lean more towards at the moment for there to be controls on information, for there to be shutdowns on communication, 
actions by states, which could actually undermine sometimes important health messages and trust in, in particular in our civil society sector and the access to information that they are able to have, who we often rely on in a lot of disease outbreak events and in peacetime disease control. So thinking more carefully about how we can bring civil society sector into our health diplomacy discussions is really important, as well as bringing in our, 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 our educational institutions, as well as thinking about not just the high level political operatives, but also those mid-level senior and senior level bureaucracy as well, who often have to manage those early moments of trying to think about how to navigate and cooperate in a disease outbreak emergency. Sarah. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, uh, I was asked to talk about gender, which I won't have time to talk about. It was my fourth, but I'll do my third one and it will come in through there. I think we need to think about um, the fantastic rules-based institutional approaches we already have in place. There's been a lot of discussion recently about them being fragile, them being not working. I think we need to think about what the world looked like before the smallpox eradication and the effort that went into that. Um, the Global Alliance for Vaccine Immunisation, the Global Fund to Fight HIV, TB and Malaria, the fact that we're now talking about a universal healthcare declaration, something that we aspire all countries to be trying to reach by 2030, the international health regulations and the discussions and the heated debate about whether or not that regulation should have led to a de declaring a public health emergency in the recent Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. None of these institutions or funding arrangements are perfect, but a world without them, where they didn't exist, would be terribly grim indeed. And I think it's really important that we think more about the gains that we have made through very hard efforts to think about these areas as not just technical enterprises, but also really important diplomatic areas of exchange and cooperation that we invest in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's over to you. So please keep your questions short, raise your hand and wait for the mic. Question down here. Where are the mic people? Oh, here we go. There's two up there as well. And they're all over the shop. Thank you. Uh, Brian Everingham. And uh, it's to Tony Press and perhaps, perhaps to Penny in her role in, as the ambassador. In my time of dealing with uh, the DFAT and uh, the Department of Environment here in Canberra for various conventions that we've attended, I've discovered that there's a major lack of resources to support our work on those conventions. I know I've asked quite a few times whether or not DFAT could provide at least administrative assistance, if not con uh, uh, protocol work, to, for example, help environment people attend Ramsar conventions and or be briefed. Uh, how in the heaven's name would we be able to deal with the various conventions that we have signed on to? And Tony, you did miss out the World Heritage Convention in your list. Uh, but um, how do we do that if uh, we do not resource our, our people to do the both the governance and the reporting that's necessary for the proper management of those conventions? I'll start. Penny may want to make a comment. Um, I will just mention the World Heritage Convention. I, I actually didn't put the World Heritage Convention in my list because it's not actually an environmental convention. But that's, a, that's a technical legal issue that we can talk about later. Um, it's a heritage convention. Uh, but look, I've written a number of reports and papers over the last few years uh, on the Antarctic Treaty, so I'll, 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 I'll leave my comments in that, in that zone, but they, they're applicable to the, every area that you mentioned. Um, and two things are, are, are apparent to me. Uh, one is that the resources that were once available um, in DFAT and elsewhere to deal with very difficult problems, um, 
So I'll give you an example. IUU fishing. Uh, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing um, in the Kamala area, the Antarctic Treaty area in the 90s and 2000s. We had a whole of government resources applied um, in various levels of, of, of technical um, assessment and capability um, with lots of international collaboration involved in that and a huge diplomatic effort that, that was run by the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, and, and Trade. I'm afraid that those resources aren't there anymore. Um, so there are some resources there, but the interactions that I've had with my colleagues in various departments um, dealing with these issues um, over the last few years, not specifically the Antarctic Division, but, but, but um, across whole of government, is that uh, there's been both a loss of skill, but also an absolute reduction in the number of people um, able to be engaged at any one time on these issues. That makes it really hard. So um, I started off by saying I've written a number of reports over the last few years. In each of them, I have said that in my view, there should be more, be more resources available to do the soft and hard diplomacy that's required in these kinds of conventions and to solve these kinds of problems. Uh, just to add to that, I mean, it's 10 years since uh, I left uh, DFAT um, and I'm not across the intricacies of uh, their finances, but it's, uh, it's pretty widely understood that they're under uh, significant pressure financially. Uh, there's no new monies uh, and um, that's a, a difficulty. A, a few things, though, that I would say. Um, we all think of foreign affairs and trade as the sort of key foreign affairs department, but there are an awful lot of other departments that uh, are working on these international issues. We've just heard about health. Um, I'm conscious there's someone here from uh, industry uh, and uh, innovation and science. Uh, they're, do, they're, uh, they're very focused on the international agenda, as we heard uh, here from CSIRO. Um, and uh, it, so it isn't just DFAT and the environment on these environment issues. Uh, and there, there is really a very significant effort to try to find, are there any pockets, are there any ways in which uh, we can tap into things that uh, have been identified as important uh, by the government and by ministers and see if you can do what you always do, craft as a good bureaucrat, you craft the proposals to try to fit it. Uh, there's money in the Pacific, so do we try to latch onto that and broaden that across into other parts of, uh, of our region? And uh, I'm quite confident that that's being done very deftly, very quietly um, by uh, uh, those bureaucrats that are looking for ways in which to protect and advance the agendas that we've been talking about. At another point that's really important is that everybody recognises that these big global challenges not only require uh, international collaboration between governments and countries, none of us can solve these problems without collaboration, but increasingly uh, we're talking about finding ways of doing it with the private sector uh, and uh, with philanthropists. Uh, now, that's not a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but uh, there is a lot of effort going into that, and uh, certainly in the case of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, uh, some very significant effort to try to raise the funds that are needed uh, that's making, making good headway. Uh, I think that that will more and more uh, internationally uh, in our region be a fact of life, that we, we're working to raise funds from the private sector and to engage the community. Crowdfunding and so on is, is really working very effectively uh, to address these problems because, frankly, the community is ahead of government in terms of environmental concern and environmental awareness and wanting action. Sarah, do you want to add? 
to that from the health perspective in terms uh, of funding? I think I think Penny okay. captured it very Fine. well. Thank you. Okay, I think there are a couple of questions over here. Hi, uh, I'm Tejesh Kashyap from the Coral Bell School at ANU. Uh, my question is to all the panelists. Uh, do you think that climate change is actually turning into an existential crisis? And uh, as Honorable Penny has mentioned that uh, we've been doing a lot with respects to ocean protection and uh, the health of the ocean, but we're still lacking with, like our Australian energy system is still dependent on fossil fuels as well as our carbon emissions have been rising last year, according to a few reports. So do you think that with America taking a back seat to the whole climate, uh, climate change crisis, do you think Australia has a bigger role to play? Do you want me to add my question, because it's a bit similar? Well, at the same time? Yes, OK. OK. Uh, Mark Beeson, AAAI and UWA. Uh, I expected this panel to be slightly depressing, and uh, it's true to form that it has been, because the subject matter is as well. I'm a professor of international politics, and the most inspiring political figure in the world today is clearly Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old schoolgirl, uh, who's had more impact on some of these debates than most of the conventional political leadership in the world has for a long, long time. And that's a great thing, in my view. So my question is, and Penny Wensley is directed to Penny Wensley in particular, but you suggested that you're experiencing Groundhog Day in your feeling about what's going on or what's not going on in actually addressing problems in the world today. And I'm not surprised at all. I mean, one, if one of the key areas we're focusing on is... Uh, trying to manage the oceans, which don't actually belong to anybody, and we can all deny responsibility for doing anything about them, in fact, then it's not surprising we're not making a lot of progress. My suggestion would be, or my specific question would be, why don't, if we're serious about doing something about climate change, why don't we start where we live? Why don't we get our own house in order where we really can act if we choose to do so, and we can close down uh, the coal sector, or we can move to do it rapidly? We can certainly... Uh, stop any new coal mining occurring in this country. And that would be a very significant that's, contribution to the entire uh, process of doing something serious about climate change. Because why would you expect Okay, I think that you've asked the question, uh, and I think that now we're into a statement. So can I pass it over to the panel to respond to both questions? Mm. Well, I... I think that uh, your point is very understandable, and I'm addressing the, the second speaker. Uh, but uh, the fact is, real politic. Uh, right now, it is in, almost impossible to have uh, a sensible discussion about climate policy in Australia. The public debate just is not healthy. Uh, and uh, I, I think we have to be realistic and recognise that there are differences of view in the community, uh, that there uh, is a fundamental uh, approach by the government that says that we have to focus on uh, having a prosperous economy in order to be able to fund, find the resources to do the sort of things, coming back to that question about resources. So I don't think it's as simple as just saying we will close down the power stations. We saw that uh, in the federal election uh, where there were people standing up and being counted and putting very strong views about uh, Adani and so on. And equally, there were a lot of people in the community who had very strong views who disagreed with that approach. So I don't think we're at the point in our own community to be able to have that discussion and make those decisive, take those decisive steps. I think we've still got a fair way to go and I think that that's real politic. Um, in the first, the first question, I don't want the first question to be neglected. Yeah, I'm going to answer it. Oh, yeah. good. thank Tony you, Tony. Tony do that one. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to answer the first question. <laughs> and of course, the rest of the panel can, can comment as well. But um, do I think it's an existential crisis a, a crisis to our existence. I do. Um, yep. I, I started reading IPCC reports f from the very first round, and I have followed the language mm. that's been used in the IPCC reports, and these reports are absolutely conservative. 
the, the, the kinds of, of negotiations that the people went through to get those words like um, uh, highly likely. Um, Ooh, it's highly likely. Um, actually, in, in conversation, that means it's happening now. We, the globe, will survive these increases in carbon dioxide emissions, but not in the kind of economic, um, social and political environment that we live in now. So it's an existential threat insofar as it threatens our economy, it threatens our populations, it threatens our health, it will change things that will fundamentally change the nature of society and the way that countries and populations interact with each other. But I'm not a pessimist. I actually think that there are things we could do. Yes. And the health of the oceans, um, the oceans are just so important, uh, in, not only in terms of driving global climate, but also in terms of mitigating climate change. Um, we have seen um, significant uh, contributions to um, te practical technology, reforestation and things like that that are very useful uh, in, in um, drawing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It's going to be a hard slog. We are going to have to take the fact that some countries may have to reduce their growth or maybe even hold their growth steady um, in order for the rest of, of society and the, the world to catch up. But I am optimistic um, that it is possible to do this, but it takes political will and international craft. I just got a, I've got two or three comments, and I, um, I'll, go, I'll go on the optimistic side as well to sort of mm -hmm. give you some hope. Um, I think we've got some amazing uh, sort of resources in front of us. We've got, I think, an unbelievably aware, skilled, um, and important asset right in front of it, which, us, which is young Australians, um, that I think um, now, once, they, once they've got access to data, digital tools, and they can integrate that with the real world, you're going to have a far better suite of uh, abilities to look for solutions and look for ways to start to work on some of the stuff. We just did a Data 61 as a part of our organisation's 500 data scientists. Uh, we just did a big uh, kind of open day in Sydney last week. I was energised and amazed at the young scientists and young partners we've got that are working on climate science analytics. They're working on digital twins of cities. Think of the matrix, think of, don't think of the matrix anymore, think of it as being real, where you can digitally look at, you know, uh, Greater Western Sydney and plan better. Um, so I'm kind of optimistic that, you know, my sons who are 15 and 17, who genuinely care about this as the most important issue, um, and those 15 and 17 year olds will become 18, 19 and 20 year olds, so they'll have a voice in the public system as well, is they've got this, unbel this unbelievable change going on right now with data, tools. We're trying to ingest a digital future for CSIRO to kind of figure out how do we take traditional science and integrate it with data. Um, so the digital science diplomacy is huge and really relevant for the, our neighbourhood. Imagine if you could do a digital twin, um, you know, what half a metre of sea rise might look like in a country, for example, in seven years from now. And, plan, and be able to act on that. It's, I'm kind of optimistic we're going to actually figure some ways to sort of start to address this in a serious way, so. Um, I can give a quick answer of that. I, I think my concern about using existential threat language is that it implies it's too late. Um, and it implies then that it's in the security realm and that you need then these um, uh, sort of almost transcendental type responses. And then that makes it, allows it to seem remote. It allows it to seem like it's out of our 
grasped, and I don't actually think it is. I think what we've heard here is that actually there are very good politics and policy around knowing what needs to be done in this space. And I think it's actually about the threat language, I think, can sometimes be useful. It can galvanise attention. It can make us pay attention. But I think we also need to focus then as well very much on there are solutions at hand. And it's not something distant. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. It's happening right now. People are being affected by it. And I think a little bit of my concern has been that up to this point, there's been a sense that we will all be affected by it one day and we've been able to be quite, those of us in more privileged positions have been able to feel remote from the people who are losing their clean water because the sea water is starting to affect their filtration systems mm -hmm. or losing their houses. That's not been our reality. Um, I think now there is people like Greta have done a really amazing, and others, you know, there's a number of others as well who've done amazing work in showing it is affecting us now, and even if it's not, we have a duty, and there are things that our politicians can and should be doing. And just as a quick note, I was reading, I'm reading a biography of Angela Merkel at the moment, and I think what's really interesting, though you may have different views about Germany's response to climate change, I think it is one of those developed countries that have been a bit more progressive in this area. And what's interesting is when you read the biography is that as a scientist, she was reading and thinking about these reports. She was thinking and crafting policy about how to respond to it, excited by the opportunities of what could be done. And I think it's that sort of thing as well that we could demand a little bit more from our leadership as well. If I could just add very, very quickly, first of all, to note that Angela Merkel began as Minister for Environment and she was working on climate change mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm. Uh, and if I've uh, projected gloom, uh, I certainly didn't want to project doom. All those points I made about what we're good at, we have got real opportunities with Australian science, Australian research and Australian technology to make a very strong contribution to finding solutions. We're already out there, we're doing it, uh, and we can do more if there is greater political will and a greater clamour from the uh, community for, uh, for Australia as a whole to be doing this. Thanks, Penny. I've, over here, two questions over here. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name's Jessica Coote. I'm an international relations and security student with the Coral Bell School at the ANU and a New Colombo Plan Mobility Scholar. Um, I'm currently conducting research on the relationship between gender identity and perceived threats of climate change. Um, some of you may have seen the news recently um, about the fact that men are generally less likely to use things like reusable shopping bags and keep cups and the like due to a fear of being seen as too feminine. Um, I was wondering whether the panel believes that there's a gender divide in the way Australia perceives the threat of climate change, why this is the case, and what we as a society can do to change this. I think the men should answer that. <laughs> I, I, I think I must live in a, sort of work in a, an environment where that doesn't manifest itself. I think you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sarah, do you want to respond? I, yeah, I mean, I, I might, the one thing I pay a heck of a lot of attention to is my children. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I don't, I kind of don't see that, but I get up every day and think about what does the world, what does Australia look like for you in 10 years time? Uh, because I was lucky enough 25 years ago that we had leaders that uh, were thinking about that in different ways. So I kind of don't really... But, you know, you're asking, maybe, maybe I am, uh, I'm just not sure. But, I mean, uh, I, I do know, I've got, a, I do know I'm a, I've got a heck of a lot of recycling bags in my back of my car. <laughs> and I do have a keep cup. Um, but it's a fair question, but I, I just don't myself... Um, I think it's kind of... This is such a massive issue that it's just kind of transgressed. And, um, yeah, I think we're just kind of all, all in this together, really, you know? Hey, look... Can, I went, I've got family that live in Western New South Wales, um, from Dubbo, all around the Dubbo, um, Gilgandra, Galagumbone, Coonabara, Brown, those kind of places. Lots of family, and we have a, we have a family reunion every um, five years or so. And the last gathering two years ago, 
Um, there are about 120 uh, relatives turned up um, over a couple of days, and we all got into discussing what was happening on the properties out in West New South Wales and climate change and all that kind of stuff. And out of that group of country people, I think there were only three that did not think that climate change was affecting the region that they lived in. I think... Yeah, it, it, I, I know what you're saying, uh, but I'm not quite... It, it, I think it manifests itself in different parts of society. And Look, I'm, I, I might have grown up on a farm, but I'm no longer... Um, that's not the sort of society that I, I move in anymore. So I think maybe ask somebody down the pub. <laughs> um, I would definitely say that the reaction to Greta Thunberg has definitely been a gendered backlash. I think there's been deliberate attempts to try and because she has been um, an individual who has who has sought to, if you like, challenge the stereotypes and the norms around what we think a 14, 15, 16 year old girl would be doing. And I definitely think she has experienced a significant amount of backlash. I think there's also been a horrific thing said about her neuroatypical condition, which I think have been particularly toxic as well. So I think maybe what's important is to separate out the how communities are feeling about this issue then from the way in which gender and other types of abilities can be used to push mm. against people when they actually don't have an answer to the issue. Yes. And so I think that's what's happening here. Um, and I think, you know, I also think we actually, more than gender at the moment, I think we might actually also, with wonderful present company, you know, present, we might also be talking too about different age sectors and different sectors mm. of experience. You know, so there's a whole, I actually think there's a whole types, there's a whole set of types going on here that's affecting the discussion. Mm. Thanks. There was a, another question over the back. Paul Lucas, oh, the Queensland you. branch Thanks, president Paul. of the AIA. <laughs> um, oh. For a long time, uh, the essence of liberal democracies has been private property ownership, and an aspect of that has been the right to own intellectual property and exploit it and indeed charge people for it. But isn't the problem now that if we're saying to countries like India, who deserve a standard of living, that if you want to generate power, uh, then uh, you know, you're not going to do it the way that we don't want to do it, uh, isn't that then incumbent upon us to say that we should be sharing technology? And what I'm asking is, what are we doing in the developed and the Western world, and what thought leadership is Australia doing uh, to, in fact, require more sharing of technology so older and uh, outgoing methods of uh, generation aren't used into the future? Pe Nigel. Perhaps for Penny. Thanks, Paul. Nigel, I think... I'll start, I think it was for you, but I'll start, though. Mm, no, I think... <laughs> <laughs> uh, for us, and like I mentioned at the start... Um, is where we've seen a huge increase in collaboration globally when it comes to research and development. So whether it's just co whether it's that core co-publication, uh, you know, like as I said in my remarks, you know, I've seen that even just in the last five years, two thirds of our scientists are collaborating, and it's both ways, right? So we're looking at issues that are relevant in the country that we're working in, but also what can we learn to bring back to Australia as well. So it's definitely got a two-way element or two-way engagement to it. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, on the intellectual property side, we, and I'm only speaking for us as an organisation, um, you know, mo most of the work that we've seen so far in terms of the growth of the intellectual property usage has still been in the developed countries. It hasn't been in the developing. Um, but we, we do a range of work, um, you know, and one thing that's changed quite considerably for us as well, and been, there's been mention of DFAT engagement, we've seen our engagement with DFAT particularly through the Indo-Pacific, double in the last five years. So we've actually been going into countries. I mean, I think a great example is the Oz for Innovation program in Vietnam, mm -hmm. where we have a three-year program that's been DFAT-led with three Australian universities to look at how we can work on agricultural productivity in Vietnam and how we can actually, you know, work with um, the local environment there to help them on the, you know, basically the productivity some of the commercialisation around agriculture. So we, we've seen a, a, a sort of a growth in it. I uh, concur with your comments. I think it's a really 
it's, it is kind of a critical element to keep kind of looking and uh, kind of challenging ourselves to be able to look to see where we can do more of that. Um, and, you know, we, we've made that a strategic pillar of the organisation, but it's been global engagement, but also what's the national benefit as well. So you're trying to balance that consistently, but I concur with your comments. Paul, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, obviously, the issue of IP is, uh, is something that we need to be looking at always, very, very carefully, uh, and we have to have our eyes wide open uh, when we are working towards greater collaboration with countries. But uh, certainly in, in the area that I'm dealing with most at the moment in relation to marine science and coral reefs science, uh, we are being very open and sharing. There is an, an enormous sense of collaboration among experts and scientists across a whole range of countries about the way in which we must share knowledge and information in order to be able to respond to this deterioration of coral reef ecosystems all around the world. And, uh, there is a generosity in publishing and making available uh, articles, uh, I think, on the part of Australia that, uh, that isn't naive. I think it's, uh, uh, it's appropriate in particular for assisting uh, and working better and enhancing collaboration with countries in our region. Uh, we've spent a lot of time today talking about China. Uh, we are working very closely with China on these issues, and we're particularly working with China on it, the challenges it has in its coastal regions and sharing information. I mean, the fact is Australia has the longest continuous monitoring system of coral reefs in the world. We, we are developing the most fantastic technologies using artificial intelligence and the algorithms we were talking about earlier, which are transforming our capabilities to, uh, to conduct research in the marine environment. And, and we are sharing that. And I think that's a good thing. Although, as I say, eyes wide open also. Thank you, Penny. Zara, I forgot the mic. Thank you, Zara Kimpton from the AAA. No. Um, if we're looking at um, what other countries are doing, um, France, um, about 70% of its uh, electricity is provided by nuclear power. Now, that has not been mentioned today. What is the view of the panel about nuclear power? We have uranium. Uh, it is clean. It does not produce uh, greenhouse gases. Why is this not in the mix? Yeah. I'll give it a go. Uh, I, um, uh, I think that Australian discussion is building up on this issue. I think it will become talked about more. Uh, there are people in the community who are absolutely opposed to it, but increasingly you are hearing uh, voices uh, suggesting that this requires greater airing and greater discussion. Uh, I think it will become part of our, not only our energy discussion, but our energy equation down the track. Nigel, do you want to add? No, I, I completely agree with Penny. I think it's got to be an increasingly discussed issue. I, Sarah? It's out of my knowledge. I just watched okay. Chernobyl on the plane, so I'm not the right person to ask right now. <laughs> I tried to go there. <laughs> How did you? Okay. Um, look, we've got time for one more quick question. Okay, over here. Ian Lincoln, this is a slightly mischievous uh, follow-up question. France used to generate over 80% of its electricity by nuclear means. It's now 70% and it's announced an intention to reduce 45. Why would that be? We should ask the French diplomats in the audience. <laughs> that wasn't a question. That, that wasn't was a being, question. <laughs> that was being mischievous. <laughs> He did say he was being mischievous. Actually, being mischievous is probably a very good way to end the panel. Um, so I'd really like to thank um, Sarah, 
Nigel, Penny and Tony for a great panel session um, and making us think somewhat outside the square of normal, um, or I don't think there is any such a thing as normal um, international <laughs> relations anymore. Um, so thank you all very much. I'd like to thank the audience, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, while the panel steps down, um, I just need to ask Graham Dobell, our journalist fellow in the Australian um, Strategic Policy Unit, to come up for his concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Kim. Oh, thank you. Good. Good.